I noticed some similarities between this and love. So would you say that the signal grew out of love in any respect? Um, technically, for sure, I guess it, it grew out of love. I mean, I was just finishing editing love when I started working on this project where I got the idea and then started working with a friend of mine, David Frigerio, and then my brother, Carlisle. Um, and so it, it actually came on the tail end of that. And I think all movies kind of like blur together to a certain extent when you're working like, you know, one thing, you're suddenly like getting on the tail end of one thing and into another thing. Like, uh, God forbid, like there is a long period of time between two movies. But um, in terms of like narratively, I mean, um, and structurally, yeah, it's, it's definitely different. But in terms of technically, yes, you know, like. I guess your technical fingerprint is tends to stick around on certain things, you know. I read that you tried to go to film school and it didn't really work out. Can you tell me <laughs> about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard. Film school is tricky, and and the the big ones are hard to get into, you know. And and when you don't know how um, to get into an industry that you really want to get into, but is really competitive. As a kid, you just look at film school and you go, well, that's a start. Like, that's where I could begin, you know. And, and if you don't have connections, you're, that's all you got, you know. And so, yeah, that was a little frustrating. But, um, you know, there's, all, there's a lot of different routes in, so. And having kind of taken that route, like, would you say that, because there's a lot of people that are like, you know, do I pay all that money to go to film sure. sport or, or do I just jump into it and get practical experience? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, there's, there's merits to different routes for sure. And I probably with different types of people, certain things are stronger for other types of people. For me particularly, I, um, I, I came up like trying to always do well academically. I was like trying to get good grades and trying to do certain things. Like I... I don't know if film school would have just been more like academic sort of standard things that I would have been chasing and and if that would have taken up more time that I ended up using doing other sort of endeavors to just try to make stuff. Um, but I, yeah, I, I went to, I kind of went to two different films because I was trying to uh, go to one, didn't get into that, and then I went to another one that was more of a photography school but they weren't going to take my general ed from the other one, so I ended up leaving that one, too. <laughs> but that one I didn't even, you know, I don't know. There's You gather stuff from all these experiences, so I guess, you know, no matter what choice you take, you just got to keep going because um, that's the hardest part. No matter what you do, there's going to be a lot of, you're going to get to a lot of no's, and it's important that in those no's, you keep chasing until you get to a yes, you know. And... Thinking back to everything you learned, building up to your first feature, was there any one thing that all of a sudden like made it click in your mind, being like, you know, I can do this, I can direct a movie? Um, I think I've always had that confidence. Like, I think I've always had the idea, like, oh, I can direct a movie. Um, and maybe that's just being ridiculous. I don't really know. But like, when you really want to do something, you really want to tell stories, you never question whether you can do that or not. I think the question is, is can I technically tell a story? Do I know what I technically need to know if I, you know, and, and that's what the, the film industry has gotten to such a crazy place right now because everyone has access to these cameras. Everyone can be a storyteller. Everyone has online editing. Um, so yeah, like you, I think if you want to be a filmmaker now, you better have that confidence because technically the tools are there. When I was just starting out, that wasn't, that didn't exist yet. And I am, like, I truly did. I was just working at Panavision, which is really where my film school was. And I I got a hold of a um, early, 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 early SDI capture card from Blackmagic when they were just starting out. And I had sent an email to Blackmagic saying, oh, I work at Panavision. I didn't tell them I was just like a prep technician and I wasn't whatever. But I was like, I would like to test your uh, card that you have. And they were like, oh, you work at Panavision? Great. So they send me this card. And I was talking to some of the digital guys at Panavision. I was like, I'm going to try to build an editing system that's going to capture, because the F900s had just come out, which were like the, the Star Wars digital cameras, and Panavision had those. And I was like, 
I'm going to try to build an editing system that can take this camera's information and put it on my Mac, which was like, I think they were called G4s at the time. It was like not, it was like really crazy. I was like going to try to build a nonlinear editing system. And I, we didn't even have SATA drives yet. And then that happened, SATA drives came out and it was the first generation of eSATA. And I literally stacked 14 hard drives on top of each other, drilled a hole through the back of the Mac and captured digital stuff, like full res, full HD, 1920 by 1080. And I took it into Panavision and I showed them what I did. And I remember uh, at Panavision, the digital guys were looking at each other like, this is insane. Like they, it was like that moment, it was that moment where like, oh my God, you can have film quality on a personal editing system that at the time I was a kid, I was like 23 or two, no, it must have been like 24. Um, I, I, anyways, it, it sounds like a bunch of techie mumbo jumbo, but at the moment it was like a big point in time where you were like, whoa, we're gonna have these tools. And now it's just like, everyone has these tools. It's like, whatever, like 14 hard drives, whatever. Like, you know Do you what fall I mean? into that? What's your workflow now? Um, you know, I, the sad part is, and even with cameras, as things started to get more digital, I made a very conscious effort because I feel like it came up a very technological way. I, mean, I was saying, it's so crazy because where we're at right now, when I was 23, 24, I came here to New York to work on the first Superman as a digital imaging technician um, when it was shot on Genesis, a Panavision camera. I think it was Brian Singer's Superman. And I was staying in the Benjamin Hotel, which is around here. I remember calling my parents being like, I am in the craziest hotel right now. It is so amazing, like blah, blah, blah. And I was so excited to see that I was going to be in this area because I might try to like go there later and revisit my younger self. But um, uh, I, I was very technologically based so I could learn the tools so I could figure out how to craft the stories I wanted to tell. But at a certain point, I let all that go. And so, yeah, I don't know what the newest sensor is in the red, and I don't know what the best sensor is in the Alexa I just know what I like, and I research the broader strokes of that, but I definitely, as a DIT, I could read waveform monitors, and I knew the tech inside and out. And like I said, I built that editing system, and I was very in, trying to gather all that stuff up so I could figure out what tools I needed to do the job. But I, um, yeah, now I, I don't really know it all that much. But it's okay, because I think as a good storyteller, you should focus on your, you know, the characters and all that, because the deeper you get into that, the crazier that gets. <laughs> How is it for you, storytelling, and not just from a visual standpoint, but through performances and things like that? Did you kind of have to learn that with your cinematography background? Um, no, I mean, I'm probably dangerous, you know what I mean? Like, because I didn't come up in a way, I've, I've read books, I, like, you know, I've read some Stanislavski stuff that I'd read that Christopher Nolan had read, you know. It's all like, oh, I should read that too. And, you know, I have a dangerous amount of knowledge about that stuff, like just enough to be completely awful to an actor, I'm sure. But no, I think at the end of the day, it, it gets down to trying to figure out where the subtext of a scene is and where the subtext of a person's emotion is and, and, and all these things that like are driving how a person is and then you're just trying to find like, usually I'll have like a notebook or I write on my arm a lot like as I'm going like while we're doing it and I'm, I'm always trying to think of like, wow, what, why, where, what are we motivating this from? But I've always said to people like as a director, especially when you finally get to that point, hopefully if you've cast it right, that job won't be really that job at all. Like really as a director, you're just trying to be the guy who is, who is um, number one, you're, you cast it okay. So then, then the next step is like just making sure, especially on an indie film where you're shooting it all out of order and there's crazy things going on, that the motivations stay true. So you're trying to like kind of stay up in your director's helicopter and you're overviewing the story and you're like, oh wait, we're just coming from this scene, we're going to that scene, he's this way right now, which he's doing a believable job, but, but we're coming from here. And so I feel like as, an, as a director, you're just trying to like motivate the pacing, keep things moving, and also like keep them true to where they need to be in the forest, if that makes any sense. It does. And then the final part, the final part is the minutia of a scene and, or the minutia of a performance. Like, and hopefully you don't even get to that part because 
you're that's all happening do you know what I mean like I feel like as a director you always think like I'm going to be directing the actor I'm going to be making him act a certain way and the irony is that is probably the last job that you have and if you have to be doing that you're in trouble already you know you're just really more worried about the motivations of something and keeping the story flowing because you as a director have to keep your eye on the forest you know not just the trees is it tough to step back and kind of see what you're giving an audience because by combining uh sci-fi and horror you know you're reaching out obviously they can be united but you're reaching out to two fans of two different genres and you need to Mm -hmm. make sure you're giving them both what they want while making them connected at the same time right right i you know i that's a really good question i think i i probably never look at it that way. I just think about what I'm a fan of and then I try to make that. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's weird. I Yeah, I don't even... I don't really think about the genres as being split up. I just think about, you know... I don't even probably think about the genres. I'm just thinking about, like... I think about movies that I like and that inspired me or made me feel a certain way and I go, I want to channel that. I want to try to find a way to do something similar or, you know, it's like... The scene, the scene in the, 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 where they pull up to the house, like, there's a whole, I could probably give you 10 different ways that that scene could go down, like, visually and sort of, like, what they would look like and, like, the ingredients that would go into them to make them look like that. And I knew what always affected me and what's, what's been affecting me lately is these movies that are very dark and very, like, you're, you're stressing your eyes to see what's on uh, on screen and like you know like it just feels really real and like even though the film doesn't really utilize those techniques unless they're right or, or even though the film isn't really in that style I still am like a really big fan of that stuff and so it then finds a way into what I'm working on. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to explain that. It's funny because you definitely have some of that there, but then some of the shots are just so vivid and there's so much detail that it's kind of like got this different effect where you can see so much that you're like looking around and trying to digest everything. Sure, sure. It's just, yeah, I guess that's what I mean. It's like, you just chase what you're a fan of. And so I, I'm a fan, I'm a fan of the Blair Witch Project. Like I'm a huge fan of that movie and I think it's, amazing filmmaking because I I remember watching that and just being like oh and so like when I get to a scene that I feel like could utilize some of that action and some of that work I I'm not really afraid to chase it and and David Landsberg who's our cinematographer is really sweet wonderful human being like I was really challenging him to like turn off the West Craven lights and to turn off all those things it's like as as a DP you're just thinking about the fluidity of 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 the shots but as a director often you're just thinking like what is needed in the moment and maybe like maybe the fluidity of the shots is going to be broken up but maybe emotionally this will channel something else or do something more you know what'd your set look like here compared to love was it a much bigger scale Um, i remember seeing pictures of love and it's like that space station in your yeah yeah no that was tiny um the civil war sets which were also kind of like down the hill and in the backyard those, those were huge um, so these, these were, yeah, there was some, definitely some bigger sets here. Um, I think what was interesting about this is like, they were leaner where they needed to be. Like with love, I didn't really know what I was doing. So actually, if you walked onto that set, which, you know, because I was building for what I wasn't even sure what I, I just didn't know as much about how lean you could be about how the camera is only going to see what the camera is going to see. So I really built out the whole ISS thing. Like it was just shit everywhere. It was like you could point the camera anywhere, which probably helped me as a filmmaker because I could just spin and go this way. When you're on a budget and you're on timing, you really know, all right, I only need to weather this, or I only need to focus on this because this is going to be what's on camera. And I think learning that, as a filmmaker, you learn that language and hopefully I'll continue to learn that language and do even bigger and better things. Um, but yeah, we had some big sets, but it was funny because they were like ultra detailed in only this one spot or whatever, you know? And can you tell me a little bit about working with Brendan too? Because he's, what is it? This, Maleficent, Oculus, The yeah. Giver. Did you kind of know what we he was gonna grow into? I didn't time? even know, like, uh, you know, Olivia Cook, like she was, coming out in, uh, or she was uh, doing uh, the 
quiet ones in, in Bates Motel. At the time, you don't really know what your actors are up to, and it's just kind of like white noise, you know? Um, and so that's a cherry on top. Like, if that happens and there's, like, a perfect storm of, of like, other work coming out at the same time, that's always really helpful. But, yeah, Brenton a, and, and Olivia and even Bo, he's, he's – oh, actually, I can't say that. Um, anyways, he's got some great stuff coming up. It's a good um, thing to hear, though. <laughs> he does. It's so, so exciting. But, uh, yeah, they were just really great people. And I wanted uh, – I've worked as a cinematographer on projects where you work with – younger people and, and or kids who are just super gnarly and, and make your life miserable. And um, I was really keen on finding people that were good people, who were people that I could, at the end of the day, secretly kind of, as a director, just channel them as real people into their characters, like, and secretly getting them to act almost just more like themselves, you know? Um, so yeah, just Brenton and Olivia, they're all just, and Bo, they're all really great human beings, and it was a lot of fun doing that with them, so. And to wrap up, how about for you? While you're promoting this one, is there anything brewing, like an idea for a next one? Um, but before we do that, I have to say Fishburn, like, the core of it all. Like, I just have to give him a shout out, because like, even though we had these newer actors, sorry, I'll get to that question in a second, it was like, to have somebody as legit and with as much power as Lawrence gave us this feeling on set of like, even though we're all newcomers and we're all trying to come up, like we have sort of a standard here to live up to. And that's sort of what I want to say, like in terms of like as great as they were, it was quickly uh, um, sort of not balanced, but it was sort of like, we just knew we were chasing, like, even though we're new and whatnot, we knew we were chasing something valuable with the interest of something like Lawrence Fishburne playing this this character across the room from them, you know? Um, so, anyways, I just had to throw that in there because it, it was one thing to have sort of, like, us all being newcomers and trying to come up, and that's exciting, but also it was very, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, encouraging to to get support from somebody like Lawrence Fishburne across the table. But, um, okay, so okay. the last question you just asked me was? What you got going on now? Um, oh, what do I have going on now? Um, lots, too many things. <laughs> That's was, a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on two things. Uh, Brian Kavanaugh Jones, who um, produced this with Tyler Davis, and he optioned another one of my projects that um, it's a little bigger, and we'll see where that one goes sort of like a 1% fantasy type thing, um, loosely based on like the Norman invasion of England. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's really Sounds cool. Sounds different. Yeah, it's very different, but very cool. Um, and then, but yeah, I, I think I'm just actually struggling with the fact that like I probably have too many movies in my head and I will never make them all before I die. So it's just about trying to choose the right ones. But some things coming up, we'll see what happens. So. 